Sunday of August. Um, good to be back amongst you after four weeks away. It was tough leaving God's country, but, you know, <laughs> good to, always good to be home, as they say. And thank you, Rod, for your good work over the past month, and to my friend uh, Jim Powell, who came to celebrate. Um, want to remember to acknowledge that this land upon which we gather this morning has been walked for generations by the Anishinaabeg peoples, the neutrals. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy is covered by Niagara Purchase Treaty 381. We continue on page 185. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God. To you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthy to magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. reading from 1st Kings. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly of Israel and spread out his hands to heaven. He said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love with your servants who walk before you with all their heart the covenant that you kept for your servant, my father David, as you declared to him. You promised with your mouth and have this day fulfilled with your hand. Therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep for your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, saying, there shall never fall you a successor before me to sit on the throne of Israel, if only your children look to their way, to walk before me as you have walked before me. Therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed that you promised to your servant, my father David. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. Regard your servant's prayer and his plea, O Lord my God, 
heeding the cry and the prayer that your servant prays to you today, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you said, my name shall be there, that you may heed the prayer that your servant prays toward the place, this place. Hear the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. O oh, here in heaven, your dwelling place, hear and forgive. Likewise, when foreigners who are not of your people Israel come from a distant land because of your name, for they shall hear of your great name, your mighty hand, and your outstretched arm. When foreigners come and pray toward this house, then hear in heaven your dwelling place and do whatever the foreigners ask of you so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel. And so they may know that your name has been invoked on this house that I have built. Discover what the Spirit is saying to the church. A reading from Ephesians. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against blood and flesh, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on the evil day, and having prevailed against everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and belt your waist with truth, and put on the breastplate of righteousness, and lace up your sandals in preparation for the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, 
a message may be given to me to, be, to make known the boldness of the mystery of the gospel. For I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. Discover what the Spirit is saying to the church. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Officially, Anglicans don't engage in the practice of observing patron saints. Now, our Roman friends might take it more seriously, 
but we acknowledge the lives of certain individuals through the year and the historical importance they've had in the life of the church universal and little more. For us, the concept of patron saints is little more than a good luck charm. That being said, I found myself tempted to preach to you today about Saint Genesius of Rome. Today is his feast day. Genesius was a performer in Rome who made fun of the Christians and their rituals on stage and on occasion before the emperor Diocletian. His act would include a mockery of the rite of baptism until one time he had a vision of an angel holding a book on which was written his sins. The angel washed the book in the water of baptism and the writing was washed clean. During that performance, he proclaimed Jesus as Lord and encouraged the audience to do likewise. Diocletian was not amused and Genesius was tortured and martyred without renouncing Jesus. His feast day is today and Genesius is considered the patron of clowns, comedians, and actors. <laughs> but as I say, Anglicans don't really observe patron saints. Turning to our readings today, we see a, a big celebration going on in the first book of Kings. The temple is complete, and Solomon has brought the Ark of the Covenant back to the Holy of Holies. For many, this would represent God coming home to live in the temple. But Solomon himself admits that God could not possibly live in a house he has built when the heavens themselves are not enough to contain him. From his prayer, we can surmise that Solomon's goal was to create a temple that would be the place where the life of God and the life of the people would intersect. It seems to me that as long as the people would follow God's ordinances and be faithful to God alone, it might have had a chance. But people are people and they get restless and start thinking things and the things they think can get them into trouble sometimes. And I don't want to say that it was a lack of faith in God that led to the destruction of the temple, but something distracted the people from using the temple to connect their lives to God's. In time, the temple would be rebuilt, but again, I think the motivation might not have been in line with God's will. From what I've been able to find out, the second temple, as it is called, was, being, was begun under the order of King Cyrus, who defeated the Babylonians. Cyrus was the king of Persia, he wasn't a Hebrew. Okay, God can work wonders through whomever. And just because a king is Persian doesn't mean that God's going to turn his back on the person. But from what I've been able to find, the temple was built because the people wanted to have the official place back where they could offer their sacrifices. They figured God, who spills over the boundaries of heaven, needed to have a temple for the faithful to offer their animals. It was not enough, I reckon, to know that God was with them in their desperation of the exile. The rituals that had meant so much to them before had to be restored. It was the way they'd always done it. The second temple was also destroyed. On or about the year 70 of the Common Era, the Romans brought the place down. And yet the church grew. Christ had come about a generation before and taught and healed and blessed. And those who followed him learned a new way to encounter God. God sent Christ to walk among us and reconcile humanity to God. We don't meet God in a building. Not in the way that God is there waiting for us to show up, and once we do, well, then we can get down to business. I remember witnessing someone telling some children that the church was God's house. They used that explanation to justify why the children should act with decorum. It's God's house, no running. It's God's house, don't raise your voice. 
It's God's house. Sit quietly and pay attention. What nonsense. First of all, we don't run because we don't want anybody to get hurt. And we sit quietly and whisper to one another so that we don't distract the people around us. It's the neighborly thing to do. And we, pray, and we pay attention because we never know when God's going to do something special and we wouldn't want to miss it. It's not a bad thing to teach children mindfulness and to be aware of what's going on around them. But for heaven's sakes, we don't teach our children that the church is God's house and we have to behave like we don't belong there. Seriously, I think the way that some people teach children how to act in church is based on the fear that God's going to notice that they're there. We're going into church now, kids. God's in there. Be careful not to wake them up. <laughs> Sorry, I got on a bit of a soapbox there. I'll climb back down. There. The point is that in church, we meet each other. While we're together, we join our voices in prayer. We pray with and for each other. We sing together. We reconcile with each other and we acknowledge the presence of God in our midst together. As a group of individuals joined in faith, we honor God, we glorify God, and thank God and petition God. So maybe I misspoke earlier. Maybe we do meet God in church, but we don't do it alone. We can meet God in here just as easily as anywhere else in all creation. In here, we meet God connected to one another as the body of Christ. And we meet God through the presence of Christ. As the early church discovered, the temple was not a necessity in the worship of God. For many Jewish converts, this might have been a difficult thing to learn. As people of God, their rituals were woven into the fabric of the community. They were faithful in the way they interacted with their families. They were faithful in the way they interacted with their neighbors. And, of course, they were faithful in the way they interacted with God. For Jesus' closest followers, the temple was losing its importance in the way they observed their faith. And I can say this with some confidence because in our gospel this morning, when the twelve were asked if they wanted to go along with others who are troubled by Jesus' teaching, Peter is very clear. Where can we go, he asks. You have the words of eternal life. If they're looking for an intersection of their life with God's, Peter knows they won't find it anywhere else. And what of those followers? Listening to Jesus talk about eating his flesh and drinking his blood was too much. It flew right in the face of the laws they had been taught, laws that were supported by the temple. Even though it came straight from Jesus, to accept something so contrary to what they understood to be true was just too difficult. It was a crucial moment in their life of faith. It was a moment from which there would be no return. Sometimes those happen. Hopefully they don't happen very often. Of course, there's no telling. When you live in a world that changes so swiftly and so drastically as this world can, in our lifetime there have been changes in the world and in the church that have brought people close to what they would call a crisis of faith. Some of these changes have left people feeling, as those early followers did, that it was just too much. I've known some folks like that. I know some who disagreed so much with the direction the church was taking that as they were leaving, they accused the church of walking away from them. It's what happens sometimes. When someone's faith is challenged, they tend to forget that all we really need to remember in order to walk together is to love God and love our neighbors. We can disagree on a whole host of other things, but if we have those, we have enough to continue. I was wondering how the reading from Ephesians was going to tie in until I got thinking about these difficult times. 
when times are rough and circumstances bring us close to second-guessing our faith, if we feel that we are at odds with our neighbors, what defense have we got? That's when it came to me. As Paul is telling the Ephesians about putting on the armor of God, it occurred to me that what he's describing is defensive in nature. Armor is for protection. It's not for attack. Yes, he mentions carrying the sword of the Spirit, but he also explains that is the Word of God. Also, he explains that the armor is to equip the faithful so that they will be able to withstand the forces of evil and stand firm. I don't know that we're facing any particularly difficult times at the moment, none that should challenge anyone's faith, but of course I cannot speak for all of us. There may be things going on in the lives of folks around us that have them wondering where God is at the moment. I pray for your perseverance in those times. I pray for your patience. I pray that you don't turn from Christ in these times, even when it's difficult to spot him at work in the chaos. I pray that you don't have to work to find Christ in those moments, but don't turn away from him. What is it that he says? Abide. Abide in me. It means stay. Remain. Abide. Stand firm. Don't run off and don't go tilting for a fight. Abide. Today is the feast of St. Genesius. The guy was looking for some cheap laughs and he found an abiding faith. He came upon some difficult times. Upon pain of death, he was told to renounce Jesus. Now, there's some kind of evil at work in that moment, folks. He wouldn't do it. Didn't run. Didn't fight. Chose to abide. Happy St. Genesius Day. God love you. Amen.
Mayor, Jim, our regional chair, and Wayne, our mayor. We pray for all who exercise authority in this land. We pray that they will be guided by the Holy Spirit. We pray also today in this land for an end to the transportation difficulties we have had. May there be peace and justice for the workers, and may the difficulties we've had been resolved in a proper fashion. We ask your blessing on all of us. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for this troubled planet, our island home. We pray especially for areas of the world where there is armed conflict, remembering especially Ukraine, Gaza, Sudan, and so many others. We also pray for areas of the world that are victims of natural disasters, of floods, fire, and tornadoes. We give thanks for the millions of volunteers throughout the world who are working to resolve this. And we pray for the efforts to bring peace both to Gaza and to the Ukraine. Bless all those who are attempting to do this, and grant your blessing and safety to the millions of volunteers who try to mollify the effects of these disasters. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for our local community. We remember this week especially the teachers and students as they begin to prepare to return to school. Bless them in their efforts. We give thanks for our municipal workers, librarians, and all who try to make this town a wonderful place to live. We ask your blessing upon them and give thanks for their efforts. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those in need. We pray for refugees and prisoners, for those who have sufficient
Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth. By water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a holy people in Jesus Christ our Lord. You renew that mystery in bread and wine and nourish us to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the holy people who have served you in every age, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name.
Joining in the prayer after communion is found in the bulletin. Let us pray. Living God, increase in us the healing power of your love. Guide and direct us that we may please you in all things. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, who is power of working in us and doing anything more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation. In the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Well, there's not a lot of announcements on the back of the bulletin, but uh, the, uh, the next order of uh, fun script cards is uh, due to go out September 9th. So we still got a couple of weeks, but uh, um, I can tell you that uh, they work wonderfully well, at least the one at Sobe sure does. Uh, yeah. um, I can tell you that from experience. Um, and then it's easy, and there's an opportunity to uh, raise some money for the church. And I gather that in the upcoming, Linda was telling me that in the, the coming month there's uh, some some places are offering more of a, a donation to the church, a higher percentage. Marshalls and Winners at Home has increased the, the rebate from 6% to 8%. Oh, okay. So Winners, okay. Winners, okay. okay. Yeah. All right, so something to consider. Think about it, you got till the night. Um, but do give it some thought. Um, want to thank Rod and Jim Powell for um, their work over the past month um, in leading worship and looking after the place um, and to everyone who uh, has been um, working and keeping the place going. Um, nice to know that things don't just grind to a halt just because I'm not around. That's the way it's supposed to work. Um, and I want to thank the parish on behalf of Brenda and our family for your prayers for Brenda's sister, Diane. Um, quick update. We saw her yesterday. We went to London. She's in a rehab hospital. Um, um, Parkwood. Parkwood, that's it, yeah. Let's see. Something wood, yeah. Parkwood Institute. And this place is dynamite. They look after um, like orthopedic recoveries and brain injuries and spinal injuries where Diane is, is and she can't say enough about the care that she's getting. She's got a physiotherapist, two occupational therapists, a social worker. The place is designed to look after the whole person. So not just your physical needs but and recovery, but emotional and spiritual and um, physical all aspects of your life. They they tend to the patient, uh, recognizing that we are more than just our medical file. And um, and she's she's flourishing. She's doing very well. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, she had an accident. She fell out of bed and broke her neck. No. C six and C six and seven. Um, sur emergency surgery was done to repair. She's got rods and screws and all sorts of things, holding the bones together. And while she's recovering, um, she wears a hard brace some of the time. Um, they want her exercising and, and stretching her, her neck and getting those muscles working again. Um, she spends some of her time in a wheelchair. She is using a walker because she's still a little shaky on her legs. But she can get herself from the wheelchair into bed she can get herself to the bathroom, and, um, and as I say, she's flourishing. And um, she knows that we've been praying for her, and she sends her thanks. Um, and uh, along with uh, Brenda and, and myself, I want to thank you for your prayers. She's, uh, she's doing very well. She, the, the plan is that she's going to be in the hospital until the first week of October. Um, but they figure that she might be back home in the span of a little more than a month. So, yeah, from breaking your neck, go figure. Um, so, yeah, tell me God isn't looking out for some of us. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, so, yeah, it, it's, been, it's, it's been quite a ride and uh, for the whole family. And, uh, but she's, she's doing well. Thank you. 
understand our turn for making chili is coming up. That, that's uh, right. Yeah. Wednesday? Yeah. And it could be a very heavy Wednesday because this is the end of the month and the checks for assistance will not have come in yet. We served 150 last time, but we also were able to help some people. And I rediscovered something among our neighbors who have to use our facilities like that, illiteracy. Um, it was clear for at least two of the women we helped that they were either, either one of the most totally illiterate or functionally illiterate. And it's a major problem uh, with poverty. So the work that you're doing on the second Saturday and on the fourth Wednesday is really, really important. It's not just food, it's companionship and kindness and listening. So thank you very, very much. Thank you also to those of you that have filled the grocery cart. It doesn't look so hungry anymore, so there will be some food and personal pro food going to cope and personal property to, uh, to the strong Frontier neighborhood. So thank you very, very much. Anything else that would be good for the rest of us to hear? All right, well, I hope you can say, there's coffee, right? There's oh, coffee. oh, yes, 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 coffee. yes, sir. All right. Well, if you'll stand as you're able, and we'll have a blessing and carry on with Sunday. Hold fast to your faith, that it may move you to act with integrity and promote justice, to choose kindness and dare to love. And the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Son, and Spirit be with you and remain and work through you and those whom you love, today and always. Amen. in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.